First of all, can you give me your full name, please? Lawrence William Copeland. We want to talk about mainly is um, your time with uh, shipbuilding and the engineering works in Bootle, Harland and Wolf. That's fine. Um, yes. So when are we talking about? How, how did you come to join them? Well, I, I first, I went to St Mary's College, first of all. And in, the, in those days, uh, Jenny, they, the, the, they wanted you to save the time. My mum and dad, want, everyone, mum and dad wanted people to save the time. That was the be all and end all. As an apprentice. As an apprentice. And I had an uncle who was working as hard as the wolves. And I wanted to go as an engineer. I was good at the maths and that. And, and they also had a cousin that was working at uh, Harlan and the wolves in the blacksmith shop. And when my uncle found out that there was uh, opportunities in the shipwrights and the blacksmiths only, he said this one the engineering jobs, apprenticeships were spoken for, went on in them at those days. So I went into say I'll say going to the blacksmiths and uh, it was hard work to just come and like the first job from school and it was a big big place, the Harland and Wolves, it was the biggest ship repair in, in Europe at the time, ship repair company. As you know, the base was in Harland and Wolves, Belfast. Yeah. Before he asked me, I didn't work on the Titanic. <laughs> but having said that, when we went into the blacksmiths, the, the first year was mainly picking things up and sometimes giving help on other people. And it served me time then from 1954 to 1959. Came out of me time, but I was, we kept on until I was called up at NAFA National Service, which everyone, uh, every male over 18 was called up. But I was deferred, you see, uh, until I came out of my time. Every, if you were serving your time, you were deferred till 21. I was 21 in the August, and I was called up in the November. 5th November I went. Well, let's, let's go back a bit. Um, the work you did... Um as an apprentice in in the blacksmiths, yes. What did you? What, what did it look like? What was there a particular blacksmith area, or were they just the, working the, on the individual ships? The, the blacksmith uh, shop, Jenny, was a huge thing, and there were over twelve fires. That they, these were fires with hoods, which took supposedly took all the fumes from the coke. Everything was coke in, in the blacksmiths. And um, they used a lot of oil to when the you were the, the, the tools we had to work with, uh, like moulding things in a way. Obviously, you couldn't get them; to, didn't want them to stick with hot metal. So that used to do that part of it. And and I've never ever heard of it before, but they used to harden things, uh, items, uh, with whale oil, and once you dipped it in the whale oil oil you couldn't see to the next fire practically and I'm serious about this how we survived it and I always thought how did these people I never smoked I didn't like it but they were smoking on top of that god knows how many so left. it was just smoke and steam coming off the and, and we had uh, four hammers uh, hydraulic hammers and these went right from the top, bottom of the shop a huge hammer it used to be used for uh, round up to, uh, diameter up to 12 diameter and what sort of things it's were you working carbon on carbon steel yeah what and we well they could make nuts to fit huge things they could make right down to what we used to call spar sealing cleats which the apprentices mainly made because there were so many to be done and we, it was a chance for the apprentices to get a little more money you got paid type of piecework if you like but it, it was varied shipside rails all things like that and the different departments uh, sparse ceiling cleats as I say the hooks they used to make hammers for the the um, boiler makers down it used to be in another shop down and below Harlands went stretched from the Regent Road up to Derby Road and I'm a quite a big site and, and that, as I said repeat myself there's not another one like it in the uh, in, in Britain anyway that's that the blacksmith shop was massive but they did it very very big jobs anchors 
when we used to do the anchors, they used to take them. Harlan's also had another place, a foundry in the, um, Little Strand Road, and they put them overnight, make a fire, because they, the, the spare anchor always had to get done. And it made overnight, it's like steep, the heat would go through it, and then the, the big hammers would come out then. So that's you and our best to free them. And, and that was with the aid of the, an overhead crane that threat sometimes be involved lifting them. So everything you can see on the, on the ship, blacksmiths were involved, and everything that was made for the requirements outside including the most important if you like lifeboats involved with things like that and the uh, derricks the whole the blocks and the, and the tackles that was involved in that were also all overhauled by the blacksmiths and the blacksmith the foreman blacksmith used to used to do tests and derricks outside and the foreman blacksmith had to do all being overhauled he had to sign along with the board of trade man that they did what they supposed to do, the, the tonnage. If it's said a five ton lift, it had to be that and it's all be signed up. Very, very important work, you know, as, as, as you understand. Did safety, you, safety. Did you enjoy it? I didn't enjoy the, the shop work as much as I did the outside work. That involved us going down into the, into the, gra in the graven docks and um, putting big shackles onto the anchor and the ship right would be then put the chain on to take the anchor up to the ship. Oh, yeah. So that that was good and we used to do a lot of, well, not an awful lot of people used to climb. Well, I kept my job a number of times because there was, there was up and down. You could be working for six months and then you could be, some yeah. people be out for Three if there was it, no job, it was yeah. very, very, yeah. very ca casual at one time. Mm. But uh, I enjoyed working outside, and I used to be able to climb at the aid of a, 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 of a, a another chap. As I can, can I mention him? Jack, Jack George, he was, and, and he was over sixty when he came to join me. Every blacksmith had a striker inside or outside the shop, and Jack had done all this climbing before. And I, I adapted myself and, and we used to climb up the derricks of the ships, we used to climb up the masts of the ships and, and take ladders from over the, the cross trees where they used to use as the boats and would go up to put the lights and all this. You don't realise there's a ladder up there but we used to do that and we used to do these cranes. Now when the last time when I had finished with the ship repair business they were getting done by another crane and a, a box, a massive box that they used to go up. We used to put them at 45 degrees and walk up them. And we also renewed a, a Tate and Lyle's silo, put ladders right up from the silo. If you know where the yeah. silo is, yeah. they're still there. And we did that with the aid of the, aid of the riggers. They were very important. We used to work alongside them, or they used to be of assistance to us. So every day was different, and that when we went from, we used to go over to um, Birkenhead. Birkenhead Docks was quite lively in them days. The Blue Funnel was there. He was also in Gladstone. The Blue Funnel. So when things were busy and you could get overtime, but unfortunately. Uh, in the middle 60s they had a lot of problems with strikes yeah. and some of the ship ship repair bill uh, went away they went to, and, and unfortunately they went to the continent in Rotterdam yeah. Hamburg places, places like that took the work off of the dock road well let's get, let's go back to the what we're talking about the 50s aren't we mainly yes yeah you, you joined in 19 1959 I went 59 to and come out in 19 end of 1961 right two years yeah so some of the major jobs that you worked on well the major jobs were always the, the uh, empress boats for Harlan and Wolfs they came in for the for the, if you like you call it like you get your car serviced it's called a layup and everything that was anything important got done. Harlan and Wolves had every trade you can 
imagine. If I said that the Harland Wolves had their own opticians, it wasn't the spectacles, it was the ship's optics for different things. And they had from there, I was a blacksmith, we also had a whitesmith. They used to do the metal for the casings, for the bearings that took the something right up the main shaft right through the ship from the engine room to the screws, I think, propellers, as, as the yeah. man in the street calls them, huge propellers, brass propellers. And they made that, the whitesmiths, they had every, everything you can think of mm -hmm. sheet metal, plumbers, coppersmiths, engineers, fitters, everything, mm -hmm. joiners, they had our own policies. They had um, a, a fleet of wagons, a big fleet of wagons, and loads and loads of um, office staff, including the timekeepers. That was a big thing. That you put on and off mostly at the ships and that. So uh, Harland and Wolf, I mean, they were, the, they were the biggest. They did have one in London, but it was not not like what we what we had. I suppose the Empress that people know most about is the, particularly in Liverpool, is the Empress of Canada. I, I thought you'd bring that up, J Jenny, because in 1953, the year before I actually went to start serving my time, that at the time was the biggest fire on, on board any vessel in the world. Yeah, there'll, there'll be people perhaps listening to this recording we're making today in the future who won't know that story. So can you, can you just tell us the story well, of the Empress? What has happened? They would uh, they'd coming in and, and getting the, the passengers used to go off and on and off, but but you're getting the ten pound assisted passage then to go to the, the what they call the colonies, Australia the and Empire. Canada and so on. Yes, that's yeah. right. And um, they were very busy. They didn't do cruising like they do the present day. They were too, they're too busy to, to taking people. You would would not not just from Britain. Used to come through here from Europe and uh, they did embark and disembark at the uh, pier head, which was much different than it is now. It had a huge ra rail connection to well, all right around the country, mainly down south. And the sheds down there, when they were busy, when we used to be going on board to, to see what jobs would be needed it when he took him to the graven dock. Now this wasn't in the graven dock. This was lying on the on the key wall. But it was getting work done and it was done by Harlan and Wolf's the work. And it, whether this is factual or not, when I say it, I worked with a with a chap, no names, and he said he had, had a feeling that he might have started the fire oh. by a bad connection for an earth wire that you needed for the welding plant. Whether that was right or not, they said it started in the galley, but no one could s s pinpoint it. But once it took hold, there was no stopping it. They had five brigades from all over the northwest on the quay. They had the, the, the tenders on the other side, keeping the distance because you can imagine a huge 22 or 3,000 ton, I'm not sure of that, but someone in that region, a vessel and, and about four decks so high, and eventually along with the, with the damage and, and the water they had to put in, it went over on its side and all the moorings they had just snapped like, like cotton, but eventually the, 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 uh, the, the, when the fire went out, the, uh, the problem was, what are we going to do with this? Yeah. And it took ages and ages, and I'm thinking the whole thing took about 12 to 18 months. Yeah. Was there only one on board at the time? There, there were people on board. Thankfully, no one was, no one was uh, seriously injured. There was maybe firemen, and, but I can't say, but there was no deaths, thank, thankfully. No. no, you didn't join for another year, but when you did join, were you involved in helping no. to do anything on the Empress? No, no but th this might be of interest to you, Jenny, of, of, of Betty One. Uh, years later, there was a ship that had broke its back at sea, and it was called the Olaf Ringal. 
and it came in in two parts into it's never been done into the brockle bank dock right outside the other side of the road of Harland and Mulls and Harland and Mulls never only put it together they put another 30 feet on its length in the middle and it was all joined up and I remember I was not all that old and I, in terms of uh, apprentices and, and we went over the, the road and we with the, the well they put uh, stanchions round and the riggers put wire on the first part that came in and then the shipwrights let that go down again and then they brought and, and made it stay down and then they brought the other part in about a fortnight later she put it all well mapped out and, and well choreographed I'd say, say the man who was in charge was a man named Mr Farney who come from Belfast one of the top people and that made his name in the company and it went out in one piece as a bigger ship than it had been and before not a, yeah. about, I, I don't know if it's a quote anyone else said this not a people not a people he'll know that <laughs> but that what's happened and, and we were always proud of that if, you know we had the union I was involved with the unions and that but, but they had a pride in, the, in this and the, in the work in those days really did